So, um, thank you very much. I have a sister Walker, and it's a pleasure to comment on these three wonderful papers. Um, I am going to, first of all, flip back to one of these slides, which I think, whoops, Yes, that one, uh, which summarizes my comments on this uh, paper. I will comment, obviously, on all papers, or at least I'll try to bring them together. Uh, the takeaway from this is that, of course, none of New York is affordable. <laughs> but the more affordable parts of New York are where the immigrant population appears to have gone and made a difference. And uh, that's the bottom line of, I think, the vehicle that has housing, through housing, that immigration has made a difference in revitalizing metro areas. Now, I will back up and give you some more details, but I'm also going to ask my, uh, make sure that my slides are going. I'm not sure if they do get on or if we have to put them in. So, um, there are three papers. Thank you, David. There are three papers, uh, and my way of bringing them together, and the title of the session is Immigration, Housing, and Economic Impacts. And it's through the vehicle housing that I'm going to attempt to bring uh, these together. But the overall question that I'm going to be uh, asking, that in some sense I think uh, all these papers are asking, is this. Is immigration a force for shared economic prosperity? I think uh, in today's economy, the questions of economic prosperity and more to the point, shared economic prosperity, are on the top, top of most uh, social scientists who are engaged and interested in uh, policy. And to give you some sort of background on myself, I was Assistant Secretary for Housing Policy for the U.S. under uh, the first President Clinton. Uh, so um, <laughs> so uh, I am personally very, very engaged uh, in these issues. So um, three wonderful papers. Um, I didn't see the papers, I should say, uh, until uh, this past uh, day or so ago. But uh, I did get to look at them uh, rather quickly at that point, and the presentations have been uh, very, very useful right now. I'm helping to, uh, for me to see how much has gone into this. Um, Phil's paper takes New York City as a gateway exemplar uh, and asks what can be learned from its renaissance. Uh, Jake's paper uh, had, is a very comprehensive look at the net impact through job and housing value. And Gary's paper uh, is looking at the different impact of immigrants, differential impact on uh, ownership of housing wealth than native population. So let me just start off by um, talking about each paper very briefly and then pulling this together in a very hopefully quickly done because I don't want to take this too far behind. So obviously immigrants have complex relationships to cities and different areas, and also there are, it's not one nation, it's not one type of gateway, uh, and there's a tremendous heterogeneity. Uh, and in that heterogeneity, New York comes out as a, a, an outstanding example in many ways. First, it is the largest uh, city for immigrants. In fact, 15% of the population of immigrants are in New York City while 6% of the overall population. And from my point, that it is very likely, well, it's not yet uh, explicitly in, in many studies, but I'm called to push studies in the direction, very likely through the housing uh, vector that uh, revitalization is occurring in metro areas through immigration. Um, are, it's a big note to make, to, which may be amazing to some people who are quite a bit younger than, than I am, is New York was viewed as a perennial population loser. It was viewed as a city that would just, would, would become what we think of Detroit as today. Inevitably, it would be uh, destroyed, depopulated, uh, it would be um, the South Bronx, uh, for those of you who were around those, that's, that was going to be not just the South Bronx, it was going to be New York. Uh, uh, President Ford famously uh, said, as uh, New York was going into bankruptcy, drop dead, New York Post. Um, and it didn't look as though it was coming back. Of course it did come back. And I believe that it came back to a large degree 
uh, through immigration, uh, not in a simplistic way, a little bit more complicated. But the complexity of this is, is a very wonderful uh, spotlight is thrown on the complexity by Phil's paper, which points to, first and foremost, of course, to stabilize the population. But then again, that's not automatic because as popular immigrants come in, it's possible, as Jake noted, that people leave. But also, neighborhoods stabilizing through reinvestment, I'll come back to that, entrepreneurial activities, and as our uh, keynoter, Rob Sanson, addressed for safer communities. And then also, and I think this is extremely important, even if in America very difficult to get a hold on, the issue of urban culture, the strengths from diversity, and of course, jobs, which I will come back to as I talk about it through Jake's paper. But another point of this question of, is it immigrants that are helping the city, or is it cities that are helping immigrants, or is it, in fact, a virtuous circle of revitalization? that reverses the net quote unquote inevitable decline um, is the support that in fact cities can and New York appears to give, even if not perfect, to facilitate integration and increase prosperity, intentional institutional support. I'll talk more about virtuous circles. So Jake's paper uses an Ivy strategy, which is uh, uh, the um, state of the art, and it's terrific and um, starts with um, some very low numbers to get to very large numbers, but they're not so large as to be unbelievable, it's 3.7 trillion actually. Our uh, total wealth in housing has been as high as about $22 trillion, so that's about, and we're getting back up there, the Great Recession dropped uh, housing wealth to $16 trillion, uh, so um, that's a real roller coaster. Uh, and, and many markets go back up. So that um, one third or so decline. But here we're talking about um, maybe a 17%, um, you know, there's obviously error here. So maybe somewhere between 10 to 20% impact on housing values, which I would argue, and I think Jake would probably agree, or it's, it's in his work, obviously, is obviously uh, concentrated just as immigration is concentrated. Now, that's through the housing, and we'll come back to that in a moment, but there is a well, and that literature is not well established, and I'm arguing that we do more work in that area, but the literature does have a burgeoning uh, area of research on what is the contribution of immigration, if there is a contribution, to, um, to jobs. And the uh, recent uh, literature, Perry and others, shows that a 1% increase in the share of immigrants leads to a 1% increase in productivity and a 1% increase in wage growth. These numbers that uh, Jake has are consistent with that. And Jake goes beyond that to do research on uh, where is this productivity gain coming from. And it appears to be coming from skills that are complementary. And that indeed Jake does explain. Now, Gary's uh, contribution here, besides uh, discussing this very interesting new measure of home ownership uh, population, which I think should be uh, explored, uh, he points to the differences in headship rates for uh, immigrants versus native uh, households. And of course, as, as it is well known, but now we have the data, uh, headship rates um, uh, turn it around. Families are simply larger. Uh, with uh, immigration, and I'm going to come back to that point in terms of its implications for metro area and reinvestment in cities, speeding ahead, mindful of the time. So the question is out there, do immigrants simply move to growth, or do they contribute to growth? And here I will um, do the slide of hand that I'm going to get the paper while talk about young papers. So um, I will talk about a paper that uh, I wrote with Dick Boyd, which basically point to the, from the view of 1990, um, the view of, of metropolitan areas and cities in America. As of uh, 1990, the 30 biggest cities as of 1970 were all losing population, and losing population rapidly. So two out of three of the largest cities in 1970 were uh, in severe decline, two thirds, uh, and then that changed. Something changed. That reversed. So that two out of three of the largest cities are now gaining population, and gaining population at a rather rapid rate. 
Well, clearly immigration is not sufficient for population revitalization. Uh, we have many examples of that immigration. I have actually some data on that, which we get to this city. But it also appears, at least from the broad perspective, and also some from the papers that we've heard today, uh, that there is a deep connection and it is an impetus, if not the impetus, in this remarkable turnaround that occurred in 1990. Now, the turnaround, as I'm focused here, as I've just said, is the largest cities. But that's not the end of the story. And in fact, as Gary points out, immigrants have dispersed and they continue to disperse so that they're extremely important in small and mid-sized cities. Now, I haven't done a study of um, immigrants. I will show you the immigrants in the 30 largest cities. I haven't shown, done a study of immigrants in the small cities, but my guess is the numbers would be even more dramatic. Because the numbers, of, the numbers in the decline in small cities, the reversal there has been even more dramatic. Think about cities that perhaps we know, near us, Allentown, Bethlehem, which were very small, uh, which were in very rapid decline, manufacturing base just destroyed, and now are indeed uh, totally uh, comeback cities. So why? Where is this coming from? Well, first of all, why the movement? Why the dispersal? And here again, I think we need more research, but I would argue that besides jobs, immigrants obviously go to jobs, I think they're uh, it's not in the data yet, but I think we should look to it because I believe it would be there, and I think it directly it is there, including Gary's data, housing affordability as a contributor to dispersion. So in these cities, the cities where housing is affordable, and this is uh, Gary's great map, which are maps, which are really spectacular, making the point. Um, I didn't have time to overlay, but the coasts are the very expensive parts of the U.S. And as you move in, these are far less expensive. So you can see really a movement from literally from blood coast to further in over time. And this dispersion, I think, is quite related, superficially correlated, at least totally correlated, with affordability. So um, in the issue of affordability, we can't be saying that immigrants are moving to a place that was desirable and making it more desirable in terms of its amenities, perhaps. Or, the move, or they didn't make the place desirable because they were moving to where the job growth was. Because in fact, housing affordability in the economist's way of looking at it, actually, although it's a good thing, it reflects bad things. It reflects the fact that the amenities are lacking. So what we have is a situation of people moving to where housing is affordable, where there are jobs, undoubtedly, and what are they doing? That's where these gains of $3 trillion comes in. They are reinvesting. And that's where the, um, uh, that's, that literal reinvestment, we know for sure, did happen in revitalizing cities. We don't know, and again, all the research, we don't know uh, that the revitalization occurred specifically where the immigrant population moved. But my guess is just uh, eyeballing it. We know that. We see it. So there is an association of immigrant reinvestment into affordable housing. And the other side of affordable housing, of course, is blighted housing, housing in disrepair. Um, so uh, a reversal of the population declines, a reversal of the housing stock declines. Um, a common component then is uh, housing reinvesting in disinvested communities. Immigration is clearly not sufficient, but an impetus. Uh, revitalization through virtuous circles, virtuous circles of job growth in cities, which then can lead to conglomeration economies. Uh, virtuous circles, housing and reinvestment that leads to tax base, and presumably perhaps culture as well. Let me just show you some of the cities. So, uh, here is the, the list of the top 30 that were in decline, including Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Francisco, New York City, perhaps surprising, Boston, Atlanta, decades of decline, and then they reversed. And the reversal is um, showing 1990, uh, 2000, uh, and red are all the cities that are growing. Of course, cities like San, Diego, uh, like San Antonio and Phoenix uh, Los Angeles have been growing throughout, 
history but, um, that we have. But these are the reversals. And if you look at the numbers of just uh, the total contribution, uh, they're pretty dramatic. The decline in Boston, but for immigrants would have been 22,000, uh, et cetera. Uh, Chicago, 47, New York, 100,000. This is uh, uh, as of 2000, carried through 2010. And here are these uh, combat cities are in green. They're throughout the country. They're not, uh, and that's the dispersal matters for that period. Uh, that's the other point. So we have new results, uh, new uh, new perspective. Um, uh, Victor provides new evidence that job creation is yet positive. Immigrants both go to where there are jobs for future job growth and they contribute to job growth. Housing investment, reversal of disinvestment. Um, uh, Jake mentioned Sice's paper, which uh, is also consistent with his research. The immigration pushes up rents and of course the downside there and housing values. I just want to note my paper with, uh, with size um, points to this as true on the neighborhood level with some exceptions. And then New York City, of course, is an exemplar of job complementarity, creating opportunity. Uh, we literally can see it uh, in the diversity. Uh, but you also need cities to be responsive to keep the virtuous cycle. So Gary did not point to this piece of research that I thought, but coming out of his research that I thought was quite interesting and perhaps pointing to a concern to be aware of going forward. And that is the large drop in Latino headship and increase in the share of adult children living with parents. Whether this means increased hardship, and it is also true that Latinos were most affected, although Gary's absolutely right that the homeownership rate did not decline carry through, they were most affected in terms of housing wealth, just because of when they were moving in. So perhaps a particular concern there. So in sum, and new questions, to what extent uh, immigration to gateways, all sorts, new, all, uh, also high school, high productive regions, reinforces, and this is a new question, the issue of big sort and the income inequality. Um, and this is uh, not uh, the, um, the housing reinforcement question does, doesn't suggest this, but Gary's uh, data does uh, to some degree. And we do have issues going forward of intergenerational wealth creation in the United States and sorting by income and human capital across the U.S. is by income levels happening. Um, to what degree does immigration interplay with that? I don't think we know the answer to that. All in sum, all three papers point to deepening our understanding of the effect of immigration on local markets, and particularly labor and housing markets. And I think to the question, is immigration driving improvements or driven to dynamic regions, immigration does make for dynamic regions. I think this is additional evidence for that. Thank you. And I'm here also. Let's all join and thank you.